Hey yo, it's your boy Angel Albatross here again with the usual suspects from the Cypher Unlimited crew. Um, we have Steven, Dean, and Anthony Spiggs with us here. And uh, yeah, wh why are we here today, Dean? Uh, we're just going to do a quick recap overview and more or less uh, commentary on GM Roulette and what we thought our takeaways, things we may have done different, things that maybe we thought done better, um, or anything that you know just strikes our fancy about the whole situation. So without further ado, we're going to let Anthony kick us off since he was the first GM in the process. What's going on, Ant? Hey, first and foremost, I would like to apologize in advance for the technical difficulties we had in the second video. And this is one of the main reasons why we're doing this recap, because unfortunately we lost the last 10 minutes of our video. But that's a, you know, a curse and a, a blessing in disguise because I got to re-watch the video, and it, I, I honestly think it changed my perspective on what my opinion was in the first video anyway. So I went first, and, um, you know, we, we drew, I, I drew the short straw, and I got to go first, and we drew fairy tale. We rolled out fairy tale as our setting, and um, at first I was a little thrown back by fairy tale, even though I know um, Al was like hooting and hollering because that was the setting he wanted to. But it was kind of difficult in a sense to get a cohesive story together quickly with fairy tale because you have to establish, I think with fairy tale, you really got to establish like the core premise of the story. And with only 30 minutes, you know, it's real hard to lay down a, a solid foundation with fairy tale. So I came up with, you know, the, the, the concept of, we, we already had a gingerbread man and Dean. So I came up with the concept of, hey, we, we, we got this gingerbread man. And now I need to get an arch nemesis, I need, which became the mayor, Stephen. So then we had this battle between, you know, good and evil, but, you know, really wasn't sure who it was. And then, you know, we, we came up with Gumdrop Manor. And then we came up with this town made of nothing but candy confections, a little village, you know, little village where everything was made of candy. So, so I had to come up with a big bad, you know, I had, to, I had to come up with the, you know, the villain of the story. So I came up with the arc and what would be a better villain for children? I mean, for a town made out of candy, but children. So I, I try to incorporate that into the mix. I also noticed that going first, you spend so much time developing, you know, the base narrative for this, you know, the entire session that it's really difficult to add any mechanical elements into the game. And I didn't notice that. Like, I honestly didn't even notice I didn't have any roles to the last five minutes of my session until I rewatched it. You know, like, I had no GM intrusions. I had one role, I think, or, or two roles the entire, my entire 30 minutes. And now that I look back on it, it was more because I was concentrating on building this foundation of like, I had to give you guys a world, set it up. So I think um, that changed my perspective. I think when you go first, you know, it's a little more work than I anticipated, but I think it was still fun. I think I, I, think I you know, I managed to pull off a, at least a decent foundation for um, Al to, to follow up behind. But if I had to change anything, <coughs> I, I think I would have probably try to get to those main story, like plot points quicker, maybe within the first or 10, 15 minutes of my story. And it, it might've made it a little easy. I could be wrong about that, but the only way I'll know for sure guys is if we run it again, if we play another session of GM Roulette, you know, because then I'll, I'll be able to, you know, examine it a little further. But I, th I think that th that was my main issue. That, and I said the word massive way too much. <laughs> I will never say that word again for at least another two months. But yeah, I think that was my, um, like my main take on that, is that when you go first, you really just concentrating on building the, you know, the base of the story for the next man, you know, to take, to take it and run with it. Um, now that you mentioned that, I think when we first played GM Roulette uh, back at Gen Con, and I was the first one, I think my session went pretty similar where there weren't really many dice rolls. It was all yeah. setting up the story and the narrative. Yeah. Um, but that's I not... I combat at the end of it, actually, back at Gen Con. But I think, again, that was like the last five minutes or so, right, or something yeah. like that. It's Again, it was on that same vein where you spend the first majority of the session actually 
building the the story and the characters and whatnot and trying to get these random characters in a way that they mesh together um <laughs> but that's the fun of it <laughs> yeah yeah i think so too and i think that your guys were so like um especially steven and dean you know with the gingerbread man mayor you know like that conflict that your guys did yourselves made it so much easier for me to just go hey you know like you know dean is all paying rp and pip you know steven is um rp and the mayor of gumdrop manor it just made it made it so much easier for me to because they were just giving me elements to add in you know just by their dialogue you know pip i'm for the people <laughs> i'm for the pip <laughs> What was it? Peeps. 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 I'm the Pip. Pip for the peeps. Pip, <laughs> no, Pip for the people. And he was saying how he gave the. Uh, I'm the mayor of the peeps. New home. He's, the, he's the mayor of the peeps. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was they, funny. They didn't have to, they didn't have to uh, live, you know, boxed up. <laughs> to a box anymore. <laughs> oh yeah, I think he said he said they were rubbing up against each other. They were so rubbing up together. Like, there's six of them living together. There's six of them rubbing up against each other. Six in a box. Yeah. No, I I say, it's, it's cruel. It's cruel. <laughs> that is definitely the case. <laughs> How about you, Al? Why so yeah, um, I went second uh, in this, uh, you know, story GM roulette. And uh, basically what I had to do was incorporate what um, Anthony had started off with and make it go forward and then give the players, you know, the other three players something to, you know, go towards and achieve. Um, but again, it was set up so well that it was very easy. Like we had the forest burning down. Um, we had the children attacking. So I had a lot of different things to work with there. Uh, and what really helped me drive the point forward was my two oddity or, you know, the elements I had to add were ghosts and fishnet stockings or light up fishnet stockings. The light up fishnet stockings I added in a fun, fun way, but the ghost part actually helped me push the story forward a little bit. Um, I kind of took that trope of, you know, a forest being mm -hmm. like in a magical place where usually a forest or some nature type deal has a guardian of some sort. And that's how I introduced the ghost. The ghost was the guardian of the forest, which was, you know, I feel like that was a good little plot point to add in there. Um, and again, it added more for the next two guys who had to go, Dean and Steven, to work off of. Now they had a guardian. They had the heart of the forest to protect. And yeah, it was a good way to add those elements in. Um, as far as what I would do differently uh, next time um, or, you know, in this particular same exact game, um, something I don't do too much, well, which Anthony was discussing earlier today, um, that he wrote down little bits and pieces of what the players were saying as they played and incorporated them into the story, like chocolate bunnies or whatever have you. That's not something I do too much, which is something I should do, which is something I will do going forward because it does give you those story uh, ambience type things to add. And it also adds consistency to the story. So we heard about chocolate bunnies in the town and then there were chocolate bunnies in the forest. So it's just that, that layer of consistency, which I probably missed the mark on just a little bit, but, it was what it was. It was still super fun, um, but yeah, it was definitely. And going second, um, again, the the challenges there were adding those hooks for the next two guys to add on to and finish off. Um, and I think I did that pretty decently. Um, yeah, I think you did it really well. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun going to. I actually like the first and second spots because you get to start it up and add those little bits. Um, but yeah, it was it was good. <laughs> uh, quick thing, I had flaming skull and mice that are on fire that don't burn, and I had the easiest out of the three of y'all because they were just married together. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so Dean, you went third. Uh, how do you feel about it? Well, I'll, I'll say it a thousand times. Honestly, I really don't matter. Doesn't matter to me what position I go in, because um, I, I think it's it's a blast. Um, the biggest thing for me. I know going, you know, in the middle, I like the threads that are left for me, you know, the pieces that are out there because it's easy to build on those. Um, but the only other thing with that is always trying to leave. Uh, I try to leave some threads for the incoming GM. I try to, you know, put whatever has been put before me and tie it up, you know, in various ways in order to, you know, come up with at least one or two items to kind of, you know, drive the narrative home. And the other thing is I spend no time during the play thinking about my portion of GMing. 
I don't think about it. I don't try to do anything because I think if I do that, I'll kind of set myself up for failure. The minute, you know, I get, when it's my turn to GM, then I go to GM mode. And when I go to GM mode, pieces and parts, all they just gel together. They make sense. It works for me. That's my thought process. Um, and I'm not telling anybody this is the way to do it. Okay. I'm just giving you an, an insight into the thought process behind what I do, you know, at this, you know, in the, these situations. Um, the other thing to point out to everyone is that I think that, you know, GM roulette could be used both by experienced GMs and new GMs. I think it'd be a great way to train new GMs, people who are just coming into the hobby who really want to take a stab at it because honestly, there is no right or wrong. There's no rhyme or reason. You don't have to know all the rules, all the nuances. You don't have to know, um, you know, or have the, the story scripted out. And it gives you that ability. I think it helps with that ability to improv at when necessary, because we all know as game masters, all our best laid plans, the minute you put it in front of a player, they're going to screw you. Smash <laughs> it. <laughs> they got to smash it. You know, if you need them to go north, they're going southwest. <laughs> you know, um, the two things that I got that I had to incorporate were hemorrhoids and robo dinosaurs. And, you know, Thea, thank you, Anthony. You know, um, so, you know, for me, again, like I said, not trying to think about how to do it. And my thought process was to add, you know, the big bag controlling the kids, you know. So I came up with the idea of Minerva Mullet, you know, this fleshy who wanted to take over the candy land and feed her hungry children, you know, to idea. Well, Stephen took it and turned them into hungry, the hungry children that she needed to feed. But I figured she wanted the mayor. And there was a nefarious plot to, you know, take over Candyland between her and the mayor. And that was kind of, you know, my my uh, my thing. And as far as the robo dinosaur and the hemorrhoids, I made it, you know, that the robo dinosaur was her secret weapon that went ran rampant because it had a techno hemorrhoid. <laughs> you know, it had a techno roid and it just made it go crazy. So you know, and they were another secret society, you know, the Technoroids wanted to take over all technology. But well, was it a, what was the name of the secret society? Oh, is that the Peppermint? Peppermint? Yeah, the yeah. Peppermint, Peppermint Squad. Squad and the Technoroids. Yeah. So. You introduced the Peppermint Squad too, wasn't that you, D? Oh, yeah. No. I, 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 no, 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 that was me. That was once, Steven. Once, once, oh. once Steven made up the Peppermint Squad, Squad, I actually threw members of the Peppermint Squad in there to attack. Oh, that's right. Steven introduced it in the when your guys had the the head to head role about the control of the town folk. Right? <laughs> right, yeah. That's when right. Steven brought in the Peppermint Squad. He yeah. brought in the Peppermint yeah, Squad. Yeah. No, I, I, I'll, I'll attach Pip to the Peppermint Squad just to, Yeah, he tried to attach us. Yeah, to I, I love that interaction between uh, Pip and the mayor. That was and, awesome. And that's what I'm saying. You guys all kind of gave me little pieces to work with. You know. Um, Al with the heart, you know, I turned it into a giant green Jolly Rancher, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, the, the, the techno dino was eating the candy because it made him feel better, you know. Uh, you know, uh, Anthony stick with the, you know, because he took the whole idea of the weather machine and turned it into a, a, a full-on plot piece. So that That's was kind of fudge. Def Con Fudge. <laughs> and I actually got a I actually got a message from a friend of mine today. Yeah. And that's he was just laughing about that Def Con Fudge. You know. <laughs> and he be, oh yeah, and I have to tell you, Anthony, he said you have a hold on, I gotta look it up real quick. He says he has a a new Jorican accent. Yeah. <laughs> oh! <laughs> The first half of it. I've gotten a little bit of feedback from the different places I've thrown up. People who've taken a look, a few people. Anyway. Tell them I said, what up? I definitely will. <laughs> Steven? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of go off a lot of the stuff that Dean said. I just wanted to say it was back when we first did it at Gen Con, I think all of us were talking about new GMs, this is perfect for them. I mean, 
it's new GMs can get really caught up in, uh, oh, who are the characters? Who are the people that are playing the characters? What is the right story that's going to keep them entertained? There is everything so random. It happens like five minutes before you play mm -hmm. and through the entire time you're playing, you cannot mess it up. So if you think you're going to mess it up in some way, you're wrong. Uh, it's already messed up to begin with. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, like when you learn physics that equilibrium is when everything in the room is on the floor, it can't fall any further. <laughs> uh, Facts. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, really, I didn't have, I didn't have any idea, especially because I was, I was a villain in the beginning. Uh, I was like, how am I going to end this thing? <laughs> I, am I just going to assign everybody to kill my character? You know, what, what, what's going to go on? Everybody already hated me anyway, uh, in all the best possible ways. <laughs> and, here, Mayor, and I was actually failing on every single roll against Dean. I guess, <laughs> because he was rolling 20s. And I think we got the intermission, and I was like, I had this perfection cipher. I could, I could have just taken the townspeople right from him, had him eaten out of my hand, but... <laughs> That's what happens when you don't look at your ciphers when they're randomly generated five minutes before. I, mean, I looked at them, but you forget about them. Uh, <laughs> you you so, utilized the perfection cipher well, though. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. I did. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was one of my favorite parts was I was trying to say, how can I use this thing? What's going to be the perfect time? Like, everybody's leaping in the battle with the, you know, uh, with that techno dinosaur, with the technoroid dinosaur. <laughs> and I used perfection cipher to, uh, <laughs> with the tamed thing. And send it after the peppermint squad that I claimed and made up just a few minutes beforehand, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, that was very good use of it. Um, but it was <laughs> so that was hilarious. But anyways, like I think it was during intermission that I was just thinking a little bit. Like we we only have like what maybe ten minutes that we're doing intermission. And I was just kind of going over my head, like oh my god, we haven't had any GM intrusions because it's that thirty minutes. No matter what section you're in. Uh, I think it was because of that intermission, Dean and I were able to be like, okay, wait a second, we got to bring some GM intrusions <laughs> in because you get so caught up in how much of this story can I get going in 30 seconds to get this ball rolling, to get the plot points in, to keep the story interesting, you know, take advantage of everything people said. I mean, Dean threw out that weather machine thing, and then <laughs> I was defending myself against the thinking it's not going to be a plot point until I get the call in the sugary intercom. <laughs> and so, and then we had the forest melting. And so my, what I'm getting into is my uh, my issue, seeing when I was going to be last, was all of a sudden, I was wondering, are people going to invade this, uh, uh, my my top secret, it does not exist, uh, wet weather machine inside the giant Easter basket, or are they going to go out to the forest? Like, those are, even in a planned uh, game, I think that's an issue, is like, okay, players are going to go east or they're going to go west. <laughs> and here you're thinking, okay, it's ending in about an hour, and we got to. <laughs> I'm like, I got to figure out how to leave. Um, and so we ended up going to the forest, and I think that's when I was like, okay, I'm a fan of tragic villains. <laughs> like a villain who is just evil for evil's sake, it works in some context, but you need, you know, when you can feel a little bit sorry for the guy, it work, it works out. So uh, that's why I had when I came up with for my part was, oh, you look into the Jolly Rancher heart, <laughs> and here you see a flashback. That's a whole. You know, the forest clue as to what's been going on with Minerva, her jealousy for the bubblegum princess, because I wasn't thinking about what my session is going to be through the entire thing. But I sort of started to be like, how can I make my mayor have a little bit more of a redeeming quality? <laughs> if, if the bubblegum princess, that I think was made up by Dean, because he was threat yelling at me about the bubblegum princess uh, in my office. Uh I was just like, what if she is the one that's gumming up the works? I was thinking it might just be my fault. I'm the mayor and I'm, no one likes me. I'm kind of a jerk. Um, but then I was like, hey, he brought in Minerva. And I'm like, great. I got a whole other person I got to satisfy in here, which is, you know. So I was like, okay, Minerva, that, that's a woman. It's all her kids. And then I was like, and then she's obviously coming on to me. I'm like, yeah, she, she's got to, you know. I just started putting these pieces together for this. Uh, she like she's in love with the mayor, but the mayor's in love with the bubblegum princess, so she kills the bubblegum princess and makes her into this giant canopy inside of there by blowing her up like a giant bubble and gums up the works. And that just it just all started falling together. Like that's what messed up the rain the rainbows and the uh, it was it raining strawberry lemonade. Was that what it was? Yeah. And you know that whole lemonade thing? I I was like stuck 
for to think of a sugary drink, and lemonade was like the first thing that came out, and then everyone started running with. St- so, and you notice everyone like changed the fruit because I think it was like Dean was like strawberry lemonade, and then somewhere else in the video I hear somebody say the cherry lemonade. I don't so, remember. Whatever, whatever this lemonade was, it was changing flavors. It's that little bit of sour to come down from the sky. Just to- <laughs> just to even things out a little bit. I'll just imagine them all running around with buckets. But that was about my thought process of just like take everything and connect it in some little way. I think if I were to do something better, uh, I did lose track of time. I got to thank Dean because he was messaging me on my screen <laughs> about, <laughs> about a couple of reminders. I was like, oh, man, we got to – I was imagining let's get back to the weather machine. All of a sudden I had to be like, oh, you guys get in the boat. It takes off and you get there really fast. <laughs> uh, you know, and then the uh, – you know the the uh, the machine you have to lick to uh, <laughs> your approval instead of retina or facial recognition. It was like you have to lick it. Um, lick it yeah, it's a, it's a kid. It's a candy world. Uh, <laughs> and I just want to add real quick. You know, for both Al and uh, Anthony, you guys actually had both of you kind of had a couple of GM intrusions. You just didn't you just didn't voice them as intrusions because yeah. your 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 first one definitely would have been. Uh, Abigail calling in uh, oh, on, yeah. on, you know, uh, Def, Defcon Fudge. Defcon, Defcon Fudge. That was probably one of the best lines in the whole dog our game. You know, you're absolutely right. I think all of us had, me and Steven were talking about that earlier today. Like, we all had instances where I think they could have been either player intrusions but and, or, or GM intrusions. It's just that in the heat of the moment, we you're don't not really, thinking about it. Yeah, right. you're not thinking about it. You're but, not. I want to ask Steven something real quick. Steven, you, do you think that we gave you too many plot lines? Because I, I was hearing your... Okay. Um, it was a lot. I think I handled it pretty good. I was connecting the threads. Oh, you ended it great. I was just wondering. Uh, no, I mean... I wonder how I, you feel about it. Yeah. Like, for, for me, I think it was fine. It was probably approaching my limit uh, for what I could have done in such a short short period uh but i mean the, but the credit also i have to say goes to you guys because yes he did go into the forest and then you know both uh both al and dean did their job of keeping it focused not and not adding too many more i mean the only one that was added that kind of threw me for a loop was minerva but then it didn't make sense <laughs> i was able to piece that together uh minerva had to come unless in there to him to be like i could see like that number of plot points could be a little intimidating because i was especially when they have different locations I can yeah. see why Minerva was at it, though, because Dean did what M- me or Al didn't do. He put a face to the big bad. You yeah. know, like, I, I had, uh, this is the big bad coming, but, you know, I had the ship showing up. But Dean was the one that had to, you know, almost like in every movie, you know, like the last 45 minutes, that's when the big bad actually shows their face. And mm-hmm. Dean was the one that did it he's he recognized that we didn't have a face on the big bad here's the thing even lack of something like that would would have probably hurt me in the end if we didn't have minerva i don't know how i would have ended that mm-hmm. uh so, you know in a as satisfactory of a way uh because they'd be like okay there's all these kids but nobody in a part of peppermint squad but we don't really know who they are you know the, the face definitely adds a lot Dean, was that part of your process when you would would... well yeah that's what i'm saying the, the stuff that you guys gave me and that's how I looked at it. I looked at this as like we were getting, we were watching some crazy movie, you know, you know, and like Steven, like you said, the last 45 minutes, 30 minutes of the movie, they reveal all the excess and who's behind it. So that's definitely was part of what I was thinking, because when you first introduced the arc, mm-hmm. uh, I thought you were going to give it to us right then and there, you know, but like I said, trying to keep myself from thinking about all the possibilities. I kind of steered away from it and left it alone and just saw where it went. Then Al, what Al did, Al actually, uh, to me, what Al did, Al set up the second, uh, the second act of the, of the movie because there's always that portion where you have to adventure to, to the goal. You know, and the goal isn't always, the goal isn't always straightforward. Mm-hmm. which I really dug. And it was a fairy tale, so that made more sense. It was a fairy tale, so fairy tales always have layers. You even, know what? The, even the simplest ones. You know what Al did that I failed at? Al incorporated crime into the story. If you notice, like, my my 30 minutes was centric on Pip 
and the mayor, and Al brought Crom into Crom. Yeah. Crom. yeah, yeah. He he brought him into the story. Like he gave him a purpose for being in the group. You know, with the whole um, root. You know, the ghost root. You know, and root only talking to him. Like right. he made him part of the story, which was awesome as yeah. well. It's funny that you mentioned that, but like when I did it, I didn't even think about it in such that hey, Chrome, Chrome isn't getting enough screen time. We need to give him. Yeah. A, I just did it because it felt organic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was literally it. <laughs> and, and I think I think that's probably one of the beautiful things about GM Roulette in the sense that even the most inexperienced game master, but if they're into the idea of telling a story they'll be able to feed on those little things and see those aspects. Because even when we did it back at Gen Con, if you remember correctly, it was just little things, you know, Bessie the Cow. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, how Bessie the Cow ended up becoming integral mm -hmm. to the story, but it was all wholly organic. I didn't do it. I had no clue that by the end of the story, Bessie was going to be, you know, a higher alien being who decided for some reason took the shape of a cow on earth. I mean, cow were sacred animals or something, you know, like dolphins and hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. I mean, so those things, I think those aspects work. And I think when you play with, you know, um, a group of people that are there to have fun, you know, and not beat you over the head with rules and, all of that, I think you really can have a great time. Yeah. Most definitely. So, so actually another takeaway I'd like to add, and this is Anthony's observation from that got lost in the technical difficulties, was uh, what we did here is having a player who is an antagonist within the group, that this is a, the way we all, we all did this and pulled this off is an excellent way to show how to do that without breaking the group apart. Yeah. Right. Because they all had, you know, in, and even, excellent point. <laughs> excellent point. And even a little bit further on to that point that you made, Stephen, not only was he the antagonist, but at the end of the day, he really, you know, he was misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Because between what you did and my thought process, of, thought process of trying to redeem him at the end, you know, I think those two things worked really, get, really well together. And mind you guys, there was no conversation. I did not know he wanted to redeem him or figure a way to. I'm just thinking to myself, okay, we're a party, we're a group. This is interactive. This is supposed to be cohesive, you know. But there you had conflict in the party, but still everybody worked together towards I Almost the got whipped with hot caramel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, you can't lie. The candy pun. That was awesome. <laughs> they were. Uh, that, that thing I would have done better is I would have gone into my kitchen and grabbed a, uh, you know, a bag of my kids' Halloween candy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is improv. Reach into a crap bag, like. <laughs> right. I, I, th I think if we run it again, we're gonna get a little more comfortable. Like, um, like I, I just think this is like hey, any Anthony, other exercise. Anthony, stop. You said you you said the wrong thing. Well, I have to correct you. No, you said if. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> when we run it again. Oh, see there, that's my. But, but this is gonna lead into my next question. We'll start with Al. What was your most memorable moment of this session that we had? Um, it could be anything. Probably, um, I would say. Well, one thing that really stuck in my mind was how you incorporated the flaming skulls and the the flaming mice. Like how they the skulls blew up into little mice that scurried around. I thought that was awesome. Um, and also, I feel like this it was your takeaway too, Anthony, was the dynamic between Pip and the mayor. Like that was just awesome in the whole beginning of the story. And um, actually giving them a chance to have a PvP role was also very fun. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, those, those two things are the biggest standout in my mind for the whole session. I'll go next because mine's is obvious because I've said it like 20 times. My favorite moment of the whole game is the mayor's speech. <laughs> first met Pip and he was defending himself. And that whole concept of, you know, that I'm a, I, I saved the peeps and that whole, like, I, I felt like it was like he was trying to convince Pip that I'm not a bad person. And he, 
by mentioning all these bad things. I, I just, I don't know, I don't know what it is. Even when I rewatched it, I enjoyed it as much as I did when he was doing it live. So that was absolutely my favorite part. And um, I'll let one of your guys, I don't know what it is, but I just felt that speech. I felt it in my core. That was funny. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, you know, with me, there were, there were so many good parts, but it was, uh, I, I do did like the dynamic between me and Dean uh, doing this. Uh, I, I love that part of the mayor's office, but I also like the, uh, us when we're out in the town outside the Easter basket with the, uh, that was surrounded by the, oh, uh, the mob. <laughs> yeah, by the mob and everybody. And I think one of the reasons it stuck out was I'm supposed to be a person, you know, he's was, you know, not very combat or he's combat oriented his way, but not, not so much. I'm the talky guy. I was eased in, in talking to people and such. And yet I just failed so miserably and his, he just rolls a natural 20. Uh, <laughs> and so it just totally changed his thing. Like this should have been easy for the mayor, but he just, <laughs> it's like, he's getting out of office after this whole candy, uh, melting. It, it, you know, it was Dean's accent too. That, that, uh, oh, and no, that, that, that was, voice was hilarious. He kept it up and Al, you kept it up too. Yeah. I, try, I tried. I tried. Pip was, Pip, Pip was a favorite of mine. It was. Uh, <laughs> he was nice. easily my favorite character I crafted for all. Oh, for you, this. You, you know, it was a classic line too when he was like, "Yo, what's your rank?" He said, "Your mother." <laughs> <laughs> and then Stephen is oh, Pip a beast. Yeah, said, mother, mother, mother Pip. Pip. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that was hilarious. And as far as me having a favorite part. Oh man, it's hard to say, but I think your GM and your player intrusion, Anthony, turning Percy into a peg leg pirate ginger man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that was really great. That just added a whole nother element to the fun that we were having, you know, because it just, you know, you know, you can see this guy with a fruit roll up wrapped around his head. You know, but every time you see him, it's on the other side. That was <laughs> you know. I, I think that with Jim Willett, player intrusions are great because they don't have to be a statistical like benefit or a, a tactical benefit. It could be just something to like anybody since we all GMs and everybody's helping the other person put as much to the narrative as they possibly can. Like I wasted two XP just to make something that I felt fit the story. You know right. what I mean? Like it had there was no benefit to me wasting the XP. But I was like, hey, we need that dynamic. If he's related to Pip, he should be the exact opposite of Pip. He shouldn't be like a clone of Pip. You know what I mean? Right. And the um other thing I'd I'd say about everything is that I just really dug the fact that everybody kind of just stayed on task. I thought that was pretty cool. You know, nobody deviated from you know, the, 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 the whole idea of what was going on. And that really made it a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> like I said, I, I can't wait to do it again. You know, I don't know what's going to be the next one. You know, <laughs> there's no way to know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's no way to know, you know, and all right, quick then, if you had, a, if you had to pick one just off the top of your head, you had to guess what would it be? If I had to if yeah. I had to pick a genre, yeah, genre. You know what? I'd like to do like a, probably a Wild West thing, some crazy Wild Westness. Stephen, sort of, I was thinking to say that I was going to say Weird West. Uh, along wow. the for me, like I got the one I wanted. We got Fairy Tale. That was like <laughs> that was, that was my, my favorite. But um, are you saying my guess what the next one's going to be, or what I would like the next one to be? Why would you like the next one to be? Probably supers. I feel like supers would be a lot of fun in GM Roulette because it's all that wackiness, and I feel like it just fits the supers pretty well. I, I I would want to do something entirely serious, so noir, something that's or or like modern, you know, something so modern something, intrigue. Yeah, so, something to show like the the um the different the opposite side of the spectrum with gm roulette that yeah we could get wacky and zany but i think we could also take gm roulette to some serious um you know like dramatic chops like yeah. where, where where we could do something that's um you know really special without you know being crazy and kooky yeah yeah definitely 
Um, but really, I'm looking forward to the next time we do this because it was a lot of fun. And hopefully we can get some other people from the server in on this because um, it is will be a lot of fun to see how other people approach the same thing that we're doing. Because um, basically, it's just been us doing it. So it would be nice to see how other people do it. And initially, when we did it at uh, Gen Con, we did do it with five people. So, yes. you know, it might be nice to do uh, a five-man uh, run with this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and... If, if necessary, I will, you know, bow out and let somebody else have a turn, but I really don't want to. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Uh, actually, I um, will, me and I were talking about this, about doing it, um, getting four people on the server that are not us. We just recorded and posted on the CU and um, okay. see how, how they feel about it, and then we'll interview them after. That you know. works, too. Mm -hmm. If anyone's up for it, anyway. <laughs> But um yeah, so this has been a good talk, guys. Um, you know, oh, go on, Dave. It's been a good talk. I know he's getting ready to close us out, <laughs> and I just need to say this: <laughs> December seventh, Cipher Unlimited raffle, hosted by Monty Cook Games, and co-hosted with the incomparable Darcy Ross. We're going to be giving away some great stuff. So, join the CU, join the raffle. You know, you never know what you might walk away with. That's facts. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, it's been a great talk. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, and thank you all, you three, for joining uh, us for this talk. Uh, it was a very fun Steven exercise the we golden did. One. Yeah, Stephen the Golden One. Alpha Dean, another golden one. And Mr. Spigs, the red one. Uh, me, the pink one. And, um, yeah, again, I want to apologize for the technical difficulties in the second video. Um, it will be posted shortly or should have been already posted by the time this video goes up. Um, and, uh, yeah, hopefully the technical difficulties don't take away too much from what we did, but I don't think it did. But And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And um, if you don't, we're going to consider this DEF CON fudge. <laughs> and uh, with that, from us at the CU, we will see you later. <laughs>